Could you hear me before? Do you know what I was saying? Okay, lovely. We're doing a little series on the Bible, and I wonder, how do you view the Bible? How do you view the message of the Bible? What does it mean to you? For many, they don't really hear much about the Bible, other than maybe walking down Sucky Hall Street, Buchanan Street, and you hear the preacher, and they're preaching something that's making you just feel, maybe God's disappointed in me. Maybe it makes you feel guilty. It's a kind of turn or burn message. And that's, what you've, that's what you've heard. Maybe for some of you, it's not that kind of message. It's more what you see on TV. And it tends to be a defense of some kind of old moralistic system. And you think, oh, man, there they are telling us off again. And you come away thinking, well, that must be just the message of the Bible. Morals, here's what to do. Here's how to be a good person, according to them. And that's where you leave it. You think, well, there's no point in looking at that. Well, and what's so great about the Bible, this little series that we're doing, Johnny started with Put Together, and he looked at how the Bible historically is just so magnificent in the way that we can look back in history and see all this evidence for it being written by eyewitnesses and so early on since the events themselves. And really, there are no other ancient texts that compare. It's amazing to see that. And then we looked last week, Lewis brilliantly helped us to see how the Bible is held together from Genesis to Revelation, this consistent message, something that theologians call a Christocentric message. Jesus is at the very heart of this whole thing, Genesis to Revelation, over thousands of years. That was pretty amazing too. But listen, if we left it at that, if we left it at that information, as important and compelling as it is, it wouldn't transform our lives. And so today, what I want to propose to you is that the Bible isn't primarily about some kind of moralistic system for you to obey. It isn't primarily some kind of tradition for you to decide you want to be a part of. It is really about joy and life, about God's love for you, and how compassionate and loving he was for you that he decided that he would come and rescue you. And actually, right from the beginning, we see evidence in the Bible building that he adores you and he wants to come and welcome you home to make you the person you were really made to be. You know, you could be really religious and study the Bible with some extraordinary passion and still totally miss the point. Jesus tells us that. John chapter 5, verse 39, he says this. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Do you see that? <laughs> you see, the whole Bible is really about Jesus. And through Jesus, you can have life. But you can read the Bible in such a way and study it diligently and still totally miss that and end up with a very dead religion. Not one that's full of life. Not one that can transform you. Not one that can change this city. Not one that can change this nation. Not one that can redeem all things. The heart of the Christian message is not knowledge about God or even doing all God's commands. It's about receiving the everlasting joy of knowing God himself, because that is what you were made for. Today, we're going to be in John 15, verses 1 through 11. It's a parable, and it's one of Jesus' I am statements. It says this, I am the true vine, and my Father 
is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. For every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So we're at the Last Supper here, okay? Jesus has just revealed that one of the disciples is going to betray him. He's been telling them, I I am going to die. I will be killed and rise three days later. I imagine the mood was somber. In front of them is the Passover meal, the most important meal of the year for any Jew. And there's a really important element on that table. The fruit of the vine. Wine. Remember that as we go through this. First thing I was to look at is the vine. What is the vine? What's, what's Jesus saying here by the vine? Now, this could be like really strange language to you. Like maybe you're uh, not a, a horticulturist. You're not really into your wine. Uh, you, you don't really know much about grapes. You don't know too much even about gardening maybe. But if you were a Jew, even if you weren't into those things, you would have immediately known the significance of what Jesus was saying. The vine had become a symbol of Israel's failures to build a life-giving nation like God had called them to. Psalm 80 tells us that they were what they were supposed to be. Kind of sums it up beautifully. You see this all the way through Scripture, this symbolism of the vine. And you see it really uh, brought together in Psalm 80. It says, You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. That, that was the beginnings. That was what, was what was good. You saw that Israel had been born to be this nation by God that was to represent him. And they filled the land. And uh, it was the land that was full of milk and honey. And the vats... The wine was overflowing. The vats were full. But there's a problem, says Psalm 80. Israel produced wild fruit, not good fruit. Now, wine was much more than just wine. Wine was a symbol of joy. Everlasting joy. But instead of Israel being a vine that produced joy, produced misery. Wild fruit was bitter and useless for producing wine. Its vine no longer needed Israel, like the vine, was to be judged, tossed out, burned up. A vine unable to produce that kind of fruit that produces joy that we're all made for that's what Israel was. Ugh, this project, this project Israel, it looked to be an extraordinary, beautiful thing. And yet they couldn't quite do it. We know this pattern, don't we? We do it with ourselves. I know I can be different. I can excel at this. I can change these habits that I have. Oh, man, I am, I'm going to get rid of those bad habits. I'm going to do the right thing next time. I'm going for it. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. And then the same cycle. Oh, I just let myself down again. This other person let me down. It didn't work out the way I wanted it to work out. We try hard and even succeed in being happy for a time. And then it all goes wrong. You see, we are trying to build our lives on things that make us happy for a short time, but we don't look to where life is truly sourced. 
We don't look to the right person. We look to us. We look to people around us. But we don't look to Jesus. We don't look to God. We do what Israel did. If you're a sports fan, if you're a Scotland fan, oh man, you know all about this. You put your hope in Scotland. Come on, Scotland, we can do it. Oh, no, we can't. (laughs) Every time. And uh, dare I say, even if you're an England fan, you might win one trophy, but I'm sure it'll go back to normal soon. And I have to tell you, I've been like that with pretty much everything I've done. I'm like really competitive as a person. I've had to fight this. Like if I'm playing tiddlywinks, it will affect my mood if I don't win, honestly, for like a while. I'm working on it, okay? Used to be days, now it's maybe only a few minutes. But, man, we live our lives like that. These are silly examples, but we actually live our lives like that. We try and put our hope into things that are never going to last, never going to sustain us, never going to give us that everlasting joy that we're made for. And even if you don't know it yet, your own efforts will leave you far, far away from the joy that we're supposed to have in God. Verse 4, chapter 15, Jesus says, you cannot bear fruit on your own. So, if that was it, it'd be pretty depressing, wouldn't it? We'll try hard, but happiness will never really come to us. Fleeting, up and down, then we die. Cheery message. Psalm 80 finishes with this really hopeful prayer, and really Jesus, I want you to see here that Jesus at the Last Supper, when he calls himself the true vine, is answering the questions that Psalm 80 leaves us with this hopeful prayer. Look down from heaven and see, watch over this vine, the root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself, your vine is cut down, it burned with fire, at your rebuke your people perish. Ugh. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand. The son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. That it's why Jesus' first miracle was to turn water into wine. He is the bringer of joy. Hope to be restored as the people of God made them to be. Oh, do you want to be everything you've been made to be? Here he comes. Jesus, the true vine. The one who will restore meaning and purpose to people. You could not do it. Israel could not do it. If you tried to keep all the commands of the Bible, you could not do it, not even for five minutes. But here comes Jesus saying, I have done it. I am the only one who can do it. I have done it. I am the promised one. This shoot who has come to bring life to the nations. So that's the vine. What about the branches? Well, here's the most wonderful news. Verses three and four, the disciples could remain in him. Why? (laughs) Because they are already clean because of the word that he had spoken to them. Jesus is the truth. He embodied the word and the truth he spoke over them set them free and what he was about to go and do would make them clean, righteous, perfected. You see, we have been joined together with the vine through Jesus. We are the branches. 
We have been given that vitality, that life, that true life, the true meaning and purpose of life, everything that we're meant to be in Christ. You see, we have become one with Jesus. And the way that he did that was by living the perfect life and dying so that you could have life. He was supposed to be, the, we were supposed to be the ones who were thrown out and burned up because we were useless. We didn't do everything we were called to do. Look at our own lives. We never make it. But he did. And he went to the cross, to this tree where he was crucified on our behalf so that he and his death could give us life. He exchanged his righteousness for our unrighteousness. He saw us in our sin, and he didn't look upon us with judgment. He didn't go like the, we maybe, maybe we feel the preacher does on the street and say, you're judged, you're gone, you're too far gone. No, you're, the, you're a sinner. He sees you in your sin, and he goes, I am compassionate for you. I love you. I adore you. I'm going to come and die the death you should have died so that you can be set free and be everything that you were made to be. Enjoy him forever. <sighs> Good news. He even says, it's better if I go so Jesus, Jesus is here with the disciples, and he's already said to them, it's better if I go. How can that be true? How can it be true that Jesus, the Son of God who is with them, would leave them better off if he left? Well, chapter 14, verses 27 and 28, tell us, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give, you, give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away, and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father. I do exactly what my Father commanded me. Come now, let us leave. And in the, in the approach to that, in the verses before, he says, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. So what's he saying here? He's saying that when I go through my death, you can have life by being joined to me in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is here today. You see, Jesus rose from the dead three days later. And then, when the church was born, he poured out the Holy Spirit on us. People like Peter went from bumbling idiots who couldn't say a thing about God. They were so scared. Couldn't defend him, couldn't stick up from, couldn't stand with him when the hour was dark. Now, they, now he preaches to thousands, risking his life. How? Because he be has become one with Christ through the Holy Spirit, filled with power and confidence. It's not earned. It's not earned. I think so often we look at the Bible, don't we, and the message of the Bible, and we just assume, like everything else, we, just, we have to earn this thing. We have to work really hard and grit our teeth, and then maybe, maybe God might accept me at the pearly gates. No, 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 no. It's a free gift. It's a free gift. You don't have to do a thing. The Holy Spirit is here, and he may well be speaking to you right now. You may have something going on in your, in your heart, in your chest, where you just you sense that, that someone is speaking to you, God is speaking to you. And as he does, he wants you to know that he has come for all you. That's why Bonte's getting baptized, because she believes and knows the truth about who Jesus is that she didn't have to come and clean herself up before she came to church. He 
cleans us up by being willing to go to the cross for us. I've had so many conversations with people. Oh, you should come along, or we should, do you want to do a Bible study together? Or, oh, no, I pff, better clean myself up first, mate. Yeah, I'm, I'm not there. No, no, that's the whole point. I'm not, I was never there. Jesus has done this for me. He's done this for you. Martin Luther, the great reformer, said this, through faith in Christ, Christ's righteousness becomes our righteousness, and all that he has become, uh, all that he has becomes ours. Rather, he himself becomes ours. In other words, the prize is Jesus. The prize is being united to him. So when you hear about the Bible's message or you hear someone talk about something in it, let me just say to you, don't take that out of context. It may well be true what they're saying, but and important. But the context is always the big picture, the big message is always that God loves you. He's come to rescue you. And he's given you this as a free gift. And that we get to be united to Christ and have all the privileges of the Son. You have, if you've put your faith in Jesus, you have been adopted as a son or daughter of God through Christ because he has shared with you his sonship. So God sees you as a son or a daughter. He treasures you in that way. True Christianity is about you being united in a real relationship with God. To abide then, as Jesus says here, in the vine, means to receive, to trust in the words that he has given it is to trust in his love, verse 7. and his, uh, Sorry, his words, verse 7. His love, verse 9. And his joy, verse 11. And actually, you cannot separate those things. So in his words, we discover that we are loved and we can have everlasting joy. Let me just talk a little bit, though, about the difference between what I mean by joy and happiness. Because this kind of joy that I am talking about does not mean that life will be a breeze. It does not mean that you will suddenly be blessed with all kinds of money and all the things that you've wanted. No, no. This joy is a joy that surpasses circumstance. Happiness is dependent upon your circumstance. Think of your happy place. Do you have a happy place? I have a happy place. It is lying in the sun with a book. It doesn't happen in Scotland very often. It's probably why it's my happy place. But Jesus, the Son of God, He provides a joy that trumps circumstance. So when I'm out of my happy place, you know, it's rudely interrupted by a child climbing on my face, then my happy place disappears. But joy in Christ never disappears. It is there, it is given to you as a gift, and it is everlasting. And you can increase in that joy, and that's what we're going to talk about last, the fruit And that is where fruit comes. Good fruit comes as a vitality of the vine flowing through into the branches. So in other words, it's about being connected to Jesus. It's about your relationship with Jesus. And what does that look like? Okay, so ultimately what we're saying is the wine that is produced by the fruit is joy But what is the fruit in itself? Well, Galatians 5 can help us out. 
love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Joy, I missed out, I think. Those are what is produced naturally when you're in relationship with Jesus. So what Christians often do, and we fall into this trap a lot, we either fall off one side or the other. What we do is we say, ah, okay, free gift of grace. That means Jesus did this for free. I can do whatever I like until I go to heaven. Woo! No, no. That's not the love for Christ that we're seeing here. That's not the love for God that we're seeing here. You see, we're being joined to the Son, and the Son loves His Father. And when we're joined to the Son, and we spend time with the Son, then we love Him more, and we want to do more to please Him, to live for Him. It's not, it's not where our identity comes. It's not where our value comes. That comes in the free gift. But now that we've received it and we spend more time with Jesus, we want to be more like him. And then on the other side, we have the opposite problem. Oh no, okay, so that's what we might call cheap grace, where we, do, we kind of just run off and do our own things, and, that, and that's wrong. I, I don't want to be like that. I, I, I do love God, so I'm, I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to grit my teeth, and I'm going to work hard to the glory of God for the rest of my days. And that is not helpful either, because what happens is we then just fall back into the same traps that Israel did. And we think that we can then do it ourselves, and we can't. And what we actually need is just more of Christ, more of his love, more of the love that flows from the Father through the Son. And when we fall more and more in love with him, we become more like him. So what's the result of remaining in the love of Jesus? It's the language he uses. Joy. Joy. Notice that. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy, that's the joy of the Son, this everlasting joy that has ever always existed between the Father and the Son and in the, this glorious relationship of the Trinity, that joy may be complete. So why? Why is it that we are to live this way? For joy. Because that is what we have been made for. To live in the joy of God. Enjoy God. Enjoy Him forever. Notice too, there's something else going on here. Pruning. Ouch. Sure. Fancy that, really, pruning. But pruning is vital if we want to have fruit in our lives. I can say to you that the most challenging time in my life was definitely the most fruitful. Maybe not immediately, but eventually it was. And the Bible talks about this in all kinds of different ways. Like gold refined in the fire is one way. I love that description. You've got to go through the fire in order to have the gold shaped the way it should be shaped and to, to mold into this glorious, shining, beautiful uh, metal. It's like that. God is doing that. So I, I just want to encourage you. Hey, we've just been through a pandemic. <laughs> and I'm sure for many of you, you've thought, Pfft, this is rubbish. And maybe you're a Christian, you're thinking, I'm supposed to be full of joy, I just feel, oh, I feel terrible. I want, to, I want to encourage you that God has a design for that. That even in that, you can enjoy God more by putting your trust and your faith in Him, turning to Him, and increasing 
enjoy. Man, how much does the world need the joy of the Lord? Look around your pals. How much does the world need this kind of joy? (laughs) People need to wake up. Our Instagram likes, whatever platform you're on now, it's way cooler than whatever I go on. Whatever it is, that, that makes you feel happy for a moment, but then down for days because someone says something, just one thing negative. Whatever it is for you that you're up and down on, you're living your life upon, you not realize it, but you are. If you're going up and down, that is what you are giving your life to. That is rubbish. Here is Jesus, the Son of God, offering offering himself to you. Receive him. Our friends need him. Talk to them about him. Go and spend more time with him so that it might overflow in your life. You see, that's how it works. We receive the love of God. And then we, as we do, we become more loving ourselves. Suddenly, our neighbor starts to notice something different about us as we notice things about them and try and love them like God has loved us. We have, more than ever before, an impoverished society whilst being the richest we've possibly ever been. People are down. People are struggling. They don't have purpose or meaning. And yet, here we have the word of the Lord embodied in Christ and given to us. In Acts, this wonderful young church in Jerusalem, we see them devoted to prayer and the ministry of the word. Let me just give you a few, if you're a Christian, if you follow Jesus, let me just give you a few things that I would really encourage you to go away with today and to do. Pray with words saturated in life-giving scripture. And as you read, read with a Christ-centered view. Look for Jesus. And then allow the word of God to be preached into your heart. Don't let it just wash over. This isn't just another text. This isn't just another book. Let it speak into your heart. And hey, in a time where we can't sing like we would normally want to, or we can't project our voices like we would normally want to, that's what the guidance says, by the way, project your voice. I think that one of the most extraordinary, powerful things you could do right now is at home, get some good, you know they're biblical songs, and just sing to the Lord and enjoy them. It will do you good. Right, we're going uh, to have another worship song just now while the kids come back in, and then we're going we're gonna to baptize Bonte. And I just want to wrap this up by saying, look, the word